What's up everybody? Welcome to Coding with Chaim. In this week's video, we're going to take a look at building our very own JS Fiddle. So of course, what we're going to be building won't be as fully featured as JS Fiddle, but it's actually going to come a lot closer than you might think. Now, if you're not already familiar with what JS Fiddle is or those kind of websites, I'm not going to actually bore you with the details of what they are because they actually have a demo to show you exactly what it is we're going to be building together. So let's go ahead and take a look. So as you can see, I'm in my browser running a localhost 3000. And what you can see is I've actually got two editors here and then I've got the output here. So you can see here I've got a component that's written in React. You can see I've got the component called main. All it does is it creates this H1 that says welcome to Code with Chaim. It uses a class name called main. And as you can see here in my other editor where I'm writing my CSS, you see that I do in fact have a class called main. And all this class is doing for now is simply saying that the color is going to be equal to blue. Let's go ahead and make a change. Let's say that this color is now going to be equal to purple. Go ahead and hit run. And as you can see, we are in fact uh, seeing that the words welcome to code with Chaim are now actually purple. Let's make a change in the actual JSX code. Let's just add some two exclamation marks here. Go ahead and hit run. And now you can see it says welcome to code with Chaim with the two exclamation marks. And of course, it's still actually purple. Let's now take this a step further. Let's go ahead and make an error. Let's make a syntax error by forgetting to add that angle bracket after the word div. Run it now, and as you can see, we do in fact get some sort of error output directly within our sort of browser here. So let's actually go ahead and build this together from scratch. Okay, so the first thing we're gonna do is actually go ahead and create a new React project, and we're gonna do this, of course, by using the create React app command line tool. So let's go ahead and say npx, create React app, and then we're gonna simply call this JS Fiddle. This will, of course, take a minute. So I'll be back once this is done. Okay, so now that Create React App is done installing all of its dependencies, I've already navigated into my newly created folder, which I've called JS Fiddle. So now I'm currently in that new React application. So now we have to actually go ahead and install some dependencies. So let's go ahead and say yarn add. So we need to install React Ace, as well as Ace Builds. And then of course, we also need to install Babel Standalone. And then finally, the last thing that we're gonna be installing, now this is of course totally optional, but I do like using it to write my CSS, is we're just gonna go ahead and install styled components. Okay, so now that the dependencies are done installing, let's actually go ahead and open up the project in VS Code. Of course, you can choose whatever editor that you typically use. I always use VS Code, so I'm just gonna go ahead and open that. Okay, so the first order of business that I kinda of wanna get, get through is to simply start building up that layout. So as you guys remember, we have this sort of layout. We have like the left side that has like the little run button. We then have the middle section that is basically housing our two editors. And then finally we have the actual right section where our output's going to be, then that's going to be an iframe. So let's actually go ahead and do the sort of basic markup of HTML and CSS now. And then we can start working on the fun stuff of actually starting to add in the functionality of making this actual editor in the browser to start working. So let's start doing the markup now. Okay, so let me show you what I've done so far. All I've really done is I've just done some basic imports and then I've actually gone ahead and built up some of the actual styled components that we're going to be using. So let's walk through the imports first. First thing I've done is I've, got, I've went ahead and I've imported the Ace editor from the library that we installed it's called React Ace. And as you can see here, I've got all of these sort of imports from importing these sort of Ace builds. And here you can see I'm importing mode the JavaScript, theme Monokai, and then mode CSS. And the basic idea is that what you can actually do is to the actual uh, compo um, editor component, you can actually pass props and you can sort of tell it that you plan on using this theme to kind of make it look different. So in other words, you can use just like in VS Code or in Atom or whatever, you might be able to have like different visual themes to kind of have different lighting schemes or different sort of color schemes within your editor. You can kind of do the same thing by sort of importing the different available themes that you might want to use. And then you can also tell sort of which language you want to use. In other words, do you want to use JavaScript or Ruby or PHP or Python? And then based on that, it'll sort of know how to sort of colorize the different keywords based on language that you're actually using. What we're doing is we're importing mode JavaScript, we're importing the theme Monokai, and then we're gonna actually go ahead and also import the mode CSS. And of course, I'm just gonna go ahead and import styles from styled components. And then like I said, just building up the sort of basic styled components that we're gonna be using. And then these are the sort of a container, iframe, control panel, and button. And then these are gonna be the actual components that we're gonna be using directly in the JSX to kind of build up our sort of layout and the sort of visuals for how our application is going to look and feel. Okay, so as you can see, we now have the markup. So you can see I've actually used the container that I built up over here, and that's gonna be pretty much wrapping everything. Then have the sort of left-hand uh, sidebar that I call the control panel. That's where we actually have the button that says run. That's the button that you're gonna be clicking on whenever you wanna actually go ahead and execute your code. As you can see, it's already referencing a function called run code, which of course we have to go and define soon. 
Then here you can see we have this little div that's going to be wrapping both of our editors. And this div simply has a height of 100% and a width of specifically 54.5% because of course I want to make sure that everything's sort of evenly spaced out will sort of equate to 100%. Now we have the first ace editor instance here. This is the one that's going to be set to mode JavaScript. Then we have the second ace editor instance right over here. This one's going to be set to mode CSS. And that's primarily the main difference between these two. Otherwise, they're both pretty much doing the exact same thing. Of course, this one is referencing an on change that's, you know, referencing the function called handle code change. And this one is referencing a function called handle CSS change value. Of course, those are functions that we're going to have to fill in very soon. But this is pretty much all we need for the actual sake of the markup. So now I can actually start working on some of the actual functionality of this application. So let's do that now. Okay, so now what I've done is I pretty much went ahead and set up the basic state that our application is going to be using. So you see here we're using a use state for our code, another use state for our CSS, and then finally another use state for our actual output. Now, as you can see, the use states for both the code and the CSS are referencing these uh, variables called initial code and initial CSS, which we currently do not have. So let's, let's actually go ahead and build it up now. Okay, so as you can see here, we now have this initial code variable, which is pretty much just a string that's literally writing out the code. So if you remember back to the sort of initial application, the demo app that I was kind of showing you guys of what we're, what we're building, when I already came to the browser, the editors already had some sort of pre-filled code, right? So this sort of JavaScript editor had some, all, you know, already a built component that was called main. And then the CSS already had a basic class called main with a simple property of color is equal to blue. And the way that that happened is because we pretty much started our, you know, state out for the editors. So as you can see here, these editors are actually bound to state. So this editor here, the sort of code editor is being bound to the value of the code variable, the code, uh, code state. And then this editor here, this one's bound to the CSS variable that's coming from state. But the initial values that are set for this particular state is coming from these variables here. So initial code, this is just this basic string that's just literally writing out that code of function main, return a div with an h1, yada, yada, yada. And then this one is simply set to a string that has a simple class of, you know, color blue. And so that's how we're kind of setting the initial values, the initial sort of code that you kind of start with sort of like the initial template that you sort of starting with whenever you actually reach the browser for the first time and then you're about to start writing your code. You already have some sort of boilerplate ready for you to go. And that's how we kind of do that. Okay, so now this is where things start to get even a little bit more interesting. As you can see, I now have created a use effect. So in other words, I'm importing use effect from React and I'm defining the use effect right over here. And I'm giving it the empty dependency array because I kind of want this to run as a did mount, only want this to run once and only once at the initial uh, sort of mounting. And then basically what I'm doing is I'm now actually going to reference the transform code that I need to be importing from Babel. So let me actually do that now. Okay, so Babel pretty much is going to be exporting this function called transform. So we're pretty much going to be referencing the at Babel standalone. And the really cool thing about this sort of Babel standalone is that you can literally programmatically just take any string of code run it through this sort of transform function and then the output is going to be sort of browser already transformed actual code that the browser can understand depending on the actual presets that you're going to be sending so let me show you what i mean by that so down here in my use effect what i'm basically doing is i'm taking this initial code that we have so this initial code references this react code over here right and so again the basic idea is i want that when you actually already come to the browser for the first time the editor already has some basic javascript code waiting for you to, to actually you know play with and then the actual result of that JavaScript code should already be showing up in the iframe that's on the right hand side. But in order for the iframe to kind of understand this code, effectively, you have to pretty much think of it as a regular browser. The browser has no way of really understanding React. It doesn't quite understand how to actually read JSX, which is why you actually have to have Babel. So typically Babel kind of works with like your Webpack, you know, configuration. You might have like a Babel loader to kind of go through your files and actually go ahead and load the Babel and then, convert, you know, convert it to actual browser ready code. But of course, that's too heavy for our use case. All we really want to just basically take some user input, run it through some sort of function that then converts it to something that the browser actually understands. And as it turns out, that's exactly what Babel Standalone will do exactly for us. So we're pretty much going to be pulling in the transform function from Babel Standalone, take this very code, tell it that we want to use the preset of env as well as react to kind of tell it that we actually want you to understand how to parse the react code and then what it's going to actually do is give us back the code which is we're just going to be calling babel output it's so now this babel output will pretty much represent just a simple string of, of code just like this is except instead of it already using jsx and stuff that the browser doesn't understand this will already be sort of transpiled code that now the browser will in fact understand 
But this in itself is yet not enough for us to actually have the ability to actually go ahead and see this directly within the browser. There's yet another step that we kind of need to do. Let me show you what I mean by that. So as you can see here, we have this set output function that we're using from our set state call over here. And then what we're doing is we're pretty much passing it whatever we're getting back from this get source doc function. So presumably there's going to be some sort of function that's going to be called get source doc that's going to effectively be taking in three arguments. So it's really going to be taking an option an object that actually has three properties. The first one is going to be this Babel output here. The second one is going to be this error object, which in this case will be null because there's of course no error. And then finally, this is going to be the CSS. I can already tell you right now what this function is actually going to be returning. It's pretty much just going to be a giant string of HTML. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're now going to take this giant string of HTML, come back down to our iframe, and we're going to go ahead and say that the source doc, which is just an attribute that exists on our iframe, will be equal to our output. So now this output, which is going to be bound to state, is literally going to be the sort of result of this get source doc, which, like I said, is basically just going to be a giant string of HTML. And within this giant string of HTML, we're going to include a script tag. And within that script tag, we're going to pretty much going to be writing our Babel output. So let me show you what I mean by that. Take, for example, our actual React application here that we, you know, that we bootstrapped using Create React App. If you go to the index.html, you'll actually notice that we have this sort of div here that's going to be called an ID of root. Now, the way that this works is, now you don't see it here because of the way that Create React App works, but the way that this typically works is there's going to be sort of a bundle that's going to get injected directly within to this sort of index.html, and then within that bundle will pretty much live all of our sort of transpiled code that's, going to, that's been webpackified and babelified, if those are actual words. I know they're not, but the point is they've already been sort of run through the actual build process to, to make them work within the sort of browser environment where there's no modules, there's no ability to understand JSX, and then that sort of module then all that code will kind of get outputted over here and then react will kind of take over and the browser will kind of take over start parsing our code and the application just kind of starts up and runs the idea basically is just like this all really works with the idea that you actually have to have an actual html file and then within the html file we have to have a script tag that has all of your code we need to mimic that exact same behavior. Because remember, the way that we're viewing this is our iframe that we're creating is really just a browser within the browser. So whatever the browser typically does, we're gonna make the iframe do exactly the same way. So if the browser needs an actual HTML file that has a script tag that includes all of your code to make it work, we need to do the exact same thing to the iframe. The iframe will basically have to just have some sort of source doc. That source doc is literally going to be an HTML file that's going to include an actual script tag that's going to include all of our Babelified code that we've gotten through the actual babel.transform function. So what we're going to do is we're going to be pretty much creating a function called uh, html.js. Okay, so I realize that this is a lot of code to kind of paste all at once, but the most of it is really just a bunch of HTML that's kind of getting built up. I'm going to sort of highlight the sort of interesting bits of what this is actually doing, but I can actually leave the entire sort of script in a gist. So in case you want to follow along and having to like actually run through and actually write all this code yourself, you can just copy it from the gist, pop it into your own file, and then it's all going to work. But I do want to actually go through the sort of interesting parts to kind of help you understand of how this is actually working. So as I've said, the only thing that needs to happen is, again, if you think about how this works in a real browser, all the browser really gets is a basic HTML file, and then you basically have a sort of script tag where you're going to be injecting your bundle to that script tag, and then React will just sort of tar start taking over. The browser will start parsing all of your actual React code that's already been babelified, so the browser can now understand it, and it all just works. So we have to mimic that exact same behavior. So what get source doc does is it's literally just a function that will pretty much return some sort of HTML. So in an instance where we have an error, it's going to just simply return an HTML um, tag here with just a bunch of HTML. It's going to have the head, the body, and then we're pretty much going to be just putting our error object in or error string rather inside of a pre tag inside of a code tag just to kind of keep the same formatting because there's going to be certain formatting that Babel will give us whenever the error kind of happens within our actual code. So sort of maintain that exact same formatting I just put it inside of a pre, pre tag instead of a code tag. Now you notice that despite the fact that these are just strings, I'm literally using real HTML tags here because again, once my iframe is going to actually go ahead and get a hold of this sort of string, the iframe just views this as a regular HTML document with regular HTML tags and then it just goes ahead and parses it and it all just works. Which is why even though this might look to you like just some kind of random string, you should treat this like regular HTML because that's exactly what the iframe is going to be doing. Now coming down to the uh, instance where there is not an error, we pretty much have this regular return statement over here. And once again, I'm just going to go ahead and build up a sort of big HTML tag. I've got the head tag, I've got the body tag, and that's where things start to get a lot more interesting. 
As you can see, I've got the ID of root, right? And the reason why that's important, because again, within every single application, again, if you come back to the sort of same index and HTML that we have from Query Act app, there's going to be a div of ID of root. And if you come to our index.js file within Create React app, you will see that we are actually taking our entire application, this app component, and we're actually going to inject it in an element by ID called root. And that's representing that is sort of referencing the very same ID of root that we have here inside of our div. So too in our own HTML, we want to do the same thing. We want to actually go ahead and create a div that's going to have an ID of root. That our code, which you can see here in the initial code, is literally doing that exact same thing. We're saying react dumb that render, take the main component that we're creating right, right up over here, and then go ahead and mount it into the element that you're going to find with the ID of root. Here we have our script text to kind of use the CDN version of React because again, we don't actually have Webpack. So in order for us to actually be able to use any sort of dependency, we have to actually add them as CDN directly within the HTML file. And then finally, here we actually have the script tag that we're going to be taking our Babel output, which remember is literally just going to be JavaScript version of code. In other words, it's just going to be a string that represents our JavaScript code that we got back from the Babel transform. So it's going to take the user entered code that they themselves write within the editor and then run through the transform function to sort of make it something that the browser could understand it sort of transpose it down to a dumber sort of less fancy version that the browser will actually understand and then we can take that put it directly into the script tag and then again all the browser is going to do at that point again when i say browser now i'm referencing the iframe all the iframe will now do is actually start reading this like regular JavaScript, just like a real regular browser would actually do. The difference is completely not existent. It's the exact same thing at this point. Now, I also wrap this inside of a try catch because if let's say the browser has some sort of difficulty parsing this code for whatever reason, you have some sort of undefined variable or some sort of parsing error, I want to put this in a try catch so in case this doesn't work, we can then come to the catch block. Again, I'm literally writing JavaScript as a string because again, this is real JavaScript. I'm inside of a real script tag because as far as the iframe is concerned, this is a real script tag. So even though to you, this might seem like I'm just writing JavaScript in a string, it's kind of weird. But again, this is real JavaScript at this point. I've put this sort of entire block of JavaScript in a try catch. And then if we come to the cache, that means that something happened that this couldn't have been properly parsed. So then what I do is actually get the body. I make, I create a pre-tag and then I tell that the pre-tags in HTML should be equal to this error, whatever it was. And then I simply take this pre-tag and then append it to the body, which is how I can also make sure that, in, you know, in case I have some sort of error that happened while we were trying to actually parse this output that Babel didn't pick up on, but the browser does pick up on, we can actually go ahead and display that error directly within the browser. So as I said, this is quite a lot of code, kind of a lot for you to just kind of like write out yourself. So don't worry about that. I just wanted you to understand this, but I'm going to take this, put into a gist, and then you can just copy it from the gist and then go and run with it. Okay, so now we're actually uh, importing that a very same get source doc function that we just talked about that's in the HTML file. And this is the very same get source doc function that's getting referenced here inside of the use effect. And so now as you can understand, what's actually happening is when we actually come to the first mounting, so we have the initial code and actually wanting to see the output of that initial code. So therefore what we're doing is we're actually calling the set output function, which we get from the actual state hook over here. And this expects you to kind of send it back a string. And that's exactly what get source doc does. It's just going to send back a string, but it's not going to be just any string. It's going to be a string of our actual HTML, which the iframe will then interpret as real HTML and actually have our, our entire application work directly within the browser. Okay, so as you can see, both of our editors are kind of going to be referencing uh, change handlers. As you can see, the actual ace editor for the uh, JavaScript handling is referencing a handle code change function. The editor for the CSS is handling a handle CSS change value function. So let's go ahead and add those now. And as you can see here, we have the two functions. And these are really very simple. All they're doing is every single time that you type in every key press, you get the value that you're typing in. You can then take that value and then simply call your appropriate uh, state handler. So in this case, for value of the code, I am simply calling my set code function, which will then update the value within this editor. And then for the CSS, I simply call set CSS value. And it's going to go ahead and update the value of this editor. Finally, the last thing that we need to do is we actually have to get this run code function to actually work. So let's do that now. Okay, so now we actually have this run code function here that is being referenced by this button here. So let's actually go ahead and see what happens when you click on this button. And so what happens is we actually have a try catch. So in the try, we basically call the same transform function that we did up over here, and then we're passing in the user's code. 
And then what we get back is the Babel output. Finally, we then call our set output function. Again, the set output function just basically expects a string. So we're then going to call the get source doc function, which will return a string that's going to be dependent on this Babel output over here. So we take this right Babel output that we just got from the transform function, pass it down. In this case, there is no error, which is why we can set error to null. And then we just go ahead and pass along the CSS as well. And that's going to actually go ahead and build up a proper nice HTML file, which we can then just go ahead and send off to the iframe. And then we can go ahead and see our changes. But should transform have some problems, some, some difficulty actually parsing your code for whatever reason, you might have made some sort of syntax error. We're then going to come to the cache block, in which case we're going to once again go ahead and call the get source doc function. Only this time the Babel output will be set to an empty string. This time the error will not be null, but rather it's going to be equal to this very E that we get right over here. We then pass in the CSS as well, which in this case doesn't really matter because we're not really going to be using the CSS. But the point is, this is how we now actually get to see the error that Babel is telling you that you've done wrong within your code. Okay, so we're done kind of writing the code and building up this application. But before we actually go ahead and run this application and see that it works, I just kind of want to mention two things. Number one, in our application, the way that we're building this now, we kind of have it working. We actually have to sort of, you know, hit the run button to actually see your changes. But you may want to make a difference. You may want to make it different where you actually have the sort of run happening throughout every single keystroke. When, in other words, as the user is actually typing, you kind of want to have it sort of compile on the fly and no need to kind of hit the run button, which as it turns out, Code Sandbox actually does that. I do just want to point out that would be a very good use case to actually go ahead and use a web worker. Because if you don't use a web worker, you're actually going to have a very sort of janky experience because the actual process of actually transforming the code can kind of block the browser. And therefore, you might have some key presses that are not going to get registered right away because it's currently compiling your code and then suddenly have like a bunch of key presses show up in your editor like a few seconds later. So to try to avoid that very behavior, you're going to want to use um, web workers. And if you're not entirely familiar with how web workers work, I actually have a video on exactly that, which you can find down. You can find a link to that down in the description box below, or you can find it up in the cards. The second thing that I want to mention is in this here video right now, we're not dealing with the actual ability of actually going to install dependencies. So Code Sandbox, as well as JS Fiddle and a few of these other sort of types of websites actually let you install dependencies. I didn't want to include that in the scope of this video because it's kind of too large, but I am kind of actually working on figuring out how to make that happen. I think I have a path. It's not that simple. It was much more complicated than I initially thought it was going to be, but I think I have it working out. So look out for a video for that in the next couple of weeks. And if you don't want to miss that video, make sure you subscribe to the channel. So with that out of the way, let's actually go ahead and run this code and see that our code that we've written together actually works and whether we actually have a proper working environment where we can actually write your code and see your output. So let's go ahead and say yarn start. Okay, so far so good. As you can see, the application is running just fine. We're loaded up to localhost 3000. Let's go ahead and make a change. Let's see if we can add this exclamation mark over here. Hit the run command. And as you can see, that shows up. Let's see if we can change the color here to be purple. The color does in fact change to purple. Let's see what happens if we make a syntax error. Go ahead and hit run. And as you can see, we actually get the output of our actual syntax error. So it all seems to be working. Well, that does it for this video. Hope you enjoyed it. I hope you found it useful. If you did, please drop a like, subscribe, and I'll see you next week in another video. Perfect.